traveling through Latin America by bus, starting in autumn of 1977. After that grueling second foreign student's workshop, I felt like I had earned a long vacation. The last time I had traveled leisurely was in the summer of 1972, and that had mixed results. Leonard Harris and myself did make it to Guyana for the first Carifesta Caribbean Festival of Creative Arts. On the way there, our hopes were dashed by the unsolicited expulsion from the estate manager's house in Dominica. Besides vacation ideas, there was another more serious motivation at work here. Act was beginning to attract serious offers of support, and I had decided to finally relocate to the Caribbean. Rather than taking a plane trip directly to Trinidad, I thought I should go the long route to Mexico, Central America, Colombia, and Venezuela onto Trinidad and Tobago. I needed three things to make this happen. First, I needed some extra funding, so I expressed this as an opportunity to view firsthand the ecological disaster that had unfolded with major earthquakes in Nicaragua in 1972. Then I needed contacts on the way. A very good friend of mine, Kathy Lee, who had taught languages in Miami University in 1969, had just taken up a post at the U.S. Embassy in Mexico City in 1972. He had promised that if I ever came to Mexico in October, he would throw a party for my birthday. I also called in favors from two of the graduates from our OI committee workshop for students one in Guatemala and the other in Bogota, Colombia. The latter had taken up a position of lecturer at the University of the Andes, Universidad de los Andes. I needed a traveling companion as it was unwise to undertake a three-month trip through Central America without a traveling companion. My best friend at Cornell, Lance Evans, I just completed his bachelor's degree from Cornell. He volunteered to come along, as he was still trying to get into law school at Rutgers University in New Jersey. It was from Brooklyn, but his father had emigrated from Panama and was anxious that his son should experience some of his old stomping grounds. Lance later graduated from Rutgers was inducted as a judge in the New York Circuit in 2016 and then elevated to the Supreme Court of New York in 2019. With some financing to visit the church programs in El Salvador, Lance and I decided that we would do this trip by bus using the Pan American Highway all the way to Panama. Mexico. We started out in the middle of September 1977 from the Texas border town of Laredo, right opposite Nueva Laredo on the Mexican side. The first objective was to reach Mexico City by the beginning of October because Kathy Lee, my friend from Miami University, was planning a birthday party for me in Mexico City. We started as regular tourists traveling from Nuevo Laredo to Zacatecas, then on to San Luis Potosí, Puebla, and finally to Mexico City, where I celebrated my birthday in a Mexican restaurant. After visiting the Guadalupe Shrine and the Teotihuacan Pyramids in Mexico City, we developed a taste for archaeological sites and set out for Oaxaca and Monte Alban. Walter Alban 
is a large pre-Columbian archaeological site in the Santa Cruz Los Ococlan municipality in southern Mexican state of Oaxaca. It was also a striking distance of our chosen crossing point into Guatemala, that is, the mountainous community of San Cristobal de las Casas, where there were buses that regularly transported citizens to the Guatemalan border. Guatemala Our hostess in Guatemala was another graduate of the Oil Community Foreign Student Workshop who had returned to Guatemala. She had organized for us to spend a night in a mountainous village to see the aftermath of an earthquake which had literally thrown down a huge mountain. I'm not sure when this damage had occurred, but it was sometime in 1976 and had registered 7.1 on the Richter scale. This place was so remote that Lance and I had literally to sit at the side of the road and await the only bus coming out of the mountains going back to Guatemala City. Nicaragua When we arrived in Nicaragua, the country was into a full-fledged guerrilla war aimed at overthrowing the dictatorship of General Somoza. The campaign, led by the Sandinistas, finally succeeded two years later, in 1978-1979 with the subsequent efforts of the FSLN to govern Nicaragua being undermined by the Contra War, which was waged between the FSLN-led government of Nicaragua and the United States-backed militias. We arrived in Managua, the capital, in late October 1977, into a city practically under siege. There were standbags in every government building. I remember a particular incident in which we went to the post office to mail some postcards. As we were exiting the grounds, I just could not resist the urge to try and sneak a photo of the soldiers from behind their barriers. My scheme was to hang my camera over my shoulder and, as I was walking, to cough loudly and at the same time press the shutter. Well, the timing was off. You could hear a cough followed by the loud sound of the click of the camera. I continued walking and tried once again. It still did not work, but by that time it had alerted both Lance and one of the soldiers. What the F are you trying to do? Lance grabbed me whispering. Are you trying to get us killed? As we exited, I tried to explain to him how I had intended it to go. Well, it didn't go that way. Did you see how fast that soldier spun around and looked at us? I couldn't because my pretense was to keep on walking with my eyes straight in front. The soldiers did catch on because before we could walk back to our hotel, a jeep with a few armed officers pulled in front of us and questioned as to who we were and why we were there. They let us go without any further interrogation. Later, I came to realize that my zeal could have easily been mistaken for a reconnaissance assignment for the rebels. That spoiled the trip for us, so we were very keen to get out of Nicaragua and go on to El Salvador. El Salvador In comparison to Nicaragua, El Salvador appeared to be a charming and peaceful country. There were some street demonstrations taking place, but these did not bother us. In fact, we did not understand what the issue was about. Part of my financing for this trip had come from a church organization in New York who wanted me to visit their missions work among the poor in San Salvador. From them, I had gained some tension among the predominantly Catholic population of the country. 
the church group with whom I had the church group with whom I was affiliated comprised mainly Protestant denominations. Liberation theology was the label granted to a movement, especially among the Roman Catholic clergy in Latin America, that combined a political philosophy, usually of a Marxist orientation, with a theology of salvation as liberation from injustice. This fueled most religious commitments, Catholic and non-Catholic, to fight against poverty. In 1973, Oscar Romero was being considered for appointment as the Bishop of the Diocese of Santiago de Maria, poor rural region. While this appointment was welcomed by the government, many priests were opposing it, especially because they feared that Romero himself would openly oppose their Marxist ideology. Ironically, Romero would go on to be appointed Archbishop of San Salvador on the 23rd of February 1977 and later to be assassinated by right-wing death squads while staying mass in his church in 1980. El Salvador, however, held another secret. One afternoon, Lance and myself thought we would watch one of the demonstrations. There were persons walking in protest down the street and an equal number of spectators on the side. We were among the latter. Then Lance leaned over to me and said, Do you realize that there are no black people in the crowd? Except that guy over there and he is in the protest. I had not realized that El Salvador was the only country in Latin America that at one point in their history prohibited the immigration of African people into their country. This Central American country had a recent history of black exclusion. It all started in the late 19th century when the Catholic Church began to classify the population. At that time, most of the population were of mixed origin, either Indian, European, or African. General Maximiliano Hernandez Martinez (1882–1966) served as president of El Salvador from 1931 to 1944. His regime was a strict dictatorship, which suppressed a communist-led uprising during its initial days in office. He promoted economic growth based on the expansion of the large coffee estates thereby benefiting the landowners and initiating links between the military and the oligarchs. In 1933, this unfriendly general became concerned about the events in Europe and, following the example of Adolf Hitler, wrote a law called the Immigration Limitations, prohibiting the entry of Africans, Asians, Arabs, gypsies and many others into the country. He did, however, urge the immigration of North Central Europeans to whiten the population. These events further strengthened the Salvadoran denial of any African roots and the Afro-descendants legally disappeared. The law was still on the books when we visited in 1977. I think it was finally repealed in 1980. In a nutshell, El Salvador was the only country in Central America that did not have a Garifuna, Mosquito, or afro antillian population. The other six republics in Central America had at least one or all of these groups living within their borders. However, do not be fooled by this fact. El Salvador's connection with Africa goes back to a much earlier time, to the era of the Spanish colonial rule. Although Salvadorans will tell you that their country is the only one in Central America that does not have a black population, that is only modern day history and it does not reduce the impact of the African presence on the country's culture. 
Panama. We were anxious to get to Panama, and more so to Panama City. But the bus schedules forced us to spend a day or two in David City in Western Panama. Once there, we got a short lesson on Panama's multi-layered system of local government. David is the capital of the province of Chiriqui and had an estimated population of less than 80,000 inhabitants in 1970s. Panama Highway ran through the city. The city was both a city and a corregimento in the Panama Pantheon of local government. A corregimento is a subdivision of a district, which in turn is a subdivision of a province. Although it is the smallest administrative division level in the country, it is further subdivided into populated places and centers. I have never figured out how well that worked for the local people. Anyway, we were soon on our way for a long ride into Panama City, crossing over a long bridge that spanned the Pacific entrance to the famous Panama Canal. One thing we had learned on our road trip was that the cheapest hotel in the city was likely to be called Hotel Central, but you cannot swear on its location. Hotel Central in Panama City was located in the heart of the city, in a rundown district with facilities that reflected the conditions around it. I remember Lance being upset to find that the toilet, which we had to share with others in the hotel, did not have a seat cover over the bowl. I had to plead with the supervisor to replace the toilet seat, which he had removed because the previous ones had been stolen. They steal toilet seats in this place? As our hotel was already in the downtown area, we were in walking distance of many of the attractions, such as the Presidential Palace and the Spanish overhanging veranda. We quickly learned how to take the bus and to shout parada when we wanted to get off. Now the Panama Highway ends at Panama City because the area between Panama and Colombia known as the Darien Gap, is a 66-mile stretch of marshland. The swamps, marshes, and rivers had made construction of the highway to connect to the Colombian border too expensive to be considered. Efforts had been made for decades to pave this gap in the Pan-American Highway, but they have all become very controversial. Planning had begun in 1971 with the help of the United States funding, but this was halted in 1974 after concerns were raised by environmentalists. Another effort to build the road began in 1992, but by 1994, a United Nations agency reported that the road and the subsequent development would cause extensive environmental damage. The Embira, Wunan, and Kuna people had also expressed concern that the road could bring about the potential erosion of their cultures. The upshot of this was that we had to purchase airline tickets and fly to Bogota, Colombia to continue our journey. Bogota, Colombia Our journey in Colombia began in Bogota. Bogota itself had some determined objectives in our itinerary. Foremost among these was the fact that one of our graduates from the Oil Committee Workshop for Foreign Students had returned home and taken up a position teaching at the University of the Andes. Another objective in Colombia was the historic city of Popayan, further south near the border with Ecuador. I will tell you more about this later. We flew into Bogota on an evening flight from Panama City. I recall being personally escorted from the plane through the immigration and into a taxi that took me and Lance right to the home of my friend. I never knew how he managed that, but somehow he had alerted the airlines of my arrival which initiated this escort. 
I suspected that it was because he had organized for me to visit with the Ministry of the Environment and to give a lecture at the university. Ovayan, La Ciudad Blanca. I spent a few days doing the tourist routine around Bogota before heading out for Popayan, that historical city in the south of Colombia. I was encouraged to visit Popayan by a grad student who had just arrived at Cornell when I was leaving in 1972. I remember his last name as Torres, but that betrays his significant lineage. Torres was the great nephew of a line of influential persons from Popayan. His great granddad was a president, and one of his great uncles was a Roman Catholic cardinal from Colombia. If you Google Popayan, you would find a fascinating story of this city, which was once the center for politics and religion in Colombia before 1850. Torres had insisted that I visit his current uncle, who was still living in an apartment in the palace in Popayan, while conducting alphabetization classes with a local peasant in a room in the palace. When one uses the word alphabetization in Latin America in 1970, it was equivalent to teaching critical race theory today. He would surely be teaching the peasants a history that not only showed them how they got into this position, but pointed the way of getting out of it. The road to Popayan was a grueling 13 hours of winding roads traversing two mountain ranges. It began in the afternoon from Bogota bus station and arrived in Cali early the next morning. We couldn't see the area as it was pitch black. We went through heavy rainstorms and experienced very cold and then very humid conditions to be followed by a cold spell once again. All of that got us to the city of Cali where we took the local bus to Popayan. Just as was expected, Torres' uncle was there in his palace, most anxious to meet us. I felt that he was being treated by the political elite as an eccentric whom they thought it wise not to touch him because of his esteemed past. He gave us a personal tour of the palace, which was closed when we arrived. I think it was on the weekend. Popayan had a lot to offer. This was a city of white buildings. I could see why it was called La Ciudad Blanca. All of the grand colonial buildings were painted white. There were no other colors in use on buildings in Popayan. In researching the city later on, I found out that Popayan had been the home of 17 Colombian presidents, as well as noted poets, painters, and composers. Popayan was also known as the University City. The University of Cauca established in 1827, one of Colombia's oldest and most distinguished institutions of higher education was located there. Lance and I were soon to enjoy some of the nightlife. That Saturday evening, we had double dates with two beautiful Colombian girls. We went to a nightclub and spent most of the time drinking the local brew, which I swore had singed my moustache red. After dropping the girls home, Lance and I were jokingly sharing our notes of the evening. Man, he getting into that agua caliente. I'm surprised you aren't drunk by now. Well, you weren't any better. I was amazed how you kept on ordering more. Then Lance made his confession. I wasn't really drinking that stuff. I was emptying my glass in the plant pot right next to my seat. I busted out in an uncontrollable laughter. Me too. I was emptying mine in the plant next to me. We just hoped that the owner of the joint did not have to replace his little decor plants in the morning.
Medellin. Well, by that Sunday, we took the arduous trip back to Bogota and were soon bidding our kind host farewell as we struck out for the city of Medellin. Medellin was a pleasant surprise. It did not appear as congested and polluted as did Bogota. In addition, there were an abundance of parks, libraries, museums, and public spaces where many cultural events took place. We had lots of opportunity to spend our money, maybe too much, because as we completed five days in Medellin, both Lance and I were running out of money. We made the decision that we would both bus it to Cartagena, tour that walled city for a day, then Lance would use his last funds to fly to Caracas and on to Port of Spain, where we would meet up again. Lance was planning on spending Christmas with his girlfriend, who was returning to Grenada from Cornell for the season. He needed to have money for that. I was planning to spend Christmas with a family whom I had known when they were residing in Guyana. The father was employed by Texaco and had been reposted to Point of Pier with his entire family. Being prudent in finance, I decided to spend my last cash balances on the bus fare from Cartagena straight to Caracas without any intervening stops. Caracas, Venezuela. The bus trip from Cartagena to Caracas was not without incident. It was a long trip, and I somehow had fooled myself into thinking that it would take six hours to get to Caracas. I think I was fixated on this six hour figure because of a desire to arrive in Caracas in the afternoon so as to catch an evening flight to Port of Spain. Well, after six hours on this bus, we pulled into this city with tall buildings and I assumed we had arrived in Caracas. I started to get off the bus with my luggage when the driver asked me why I was leaving. I asked him if this was not Caracas. He laughed and said, sit down, take another nap, my friend. This is Barakitimito. We had another six hours before we reached Caracas. Oh boy. That not only meant I would miss that connection, but now I would have to find a cheap hotel in Caracas to stay for the night and that was not an encouraging prospect when you are down to your last dollar. No room in the inn. The bus arrived in Caracas at about 11 p.m. Tired and weary, I took a seat on the bench in the waiting room pretending that I was awaiting another bus. I had decided that I would leave my luggage and go and look for a hotel room for the night and then return for the luggage. It was not safe to be walking around downtown Caracas with traveling bags at midnight. With my halt in Spanish, the message of seeking a hotel room had gotten through but not the intention. I was soon directed to a shabby joint where this guy showed me a room with a single bed, nothing else. It was in my price range, and I gladly told him that I would take it and would soon be back. He smiled expectedly. About a half an hour later, I returned to the hotel, this time with my luggage, which by that time was a suitcase and a few bags. The hotel owner looked at me and started to speak agitatively that I could not get the room. As a matter of fact, he gave me back my money, saying he was sorry. I later realized that this was a hotel of convenience and turning up with bags rather than a companion meant that I was planning on staying for hours, during which time he could have accommodated at least three other couples each at that bargain price. I had no choice but to return to the bus station, where I slept on the bench along with the lottery ticket vendors. 
next day, I was off to the airport that services Caracas and was ever so happy to arrive in Port of Spain three months and a half after we had left Laredo, Texas. Thank you.